Should I start? Yeah, I, I gave a shout out to everyone, I think. All right. Thank you all. See who's going to come. So, this is the session on Indie Auth, specifically distributed Indie Auth. And um, I feel like I need to give a massive disclaimer at the beginning of this. And I apologize that this is very confusing because of the way things are named. Um, and this is absolutely my fault. Uh, but it is way too late to take it back. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping I can sort of fix it going forward. The problem is that IndieAuth.com uh, confuses people because of how often it pops up when you're looking at various sites and uh, however it's doing different things and part of talking about distributed indie auth is going to talk about clarifying its role in this um, so the the um, what Jeremy showed this morning of logging into websites using the Twitter to do the authentication or GitHub or things like that. That's what's um, that's what's actually called Realme Auth, which is the idea that your website has a link, a Realme link to um, a to a, a provider like uh, Twitter or GitHub or some others that support authentication. Um, those link back, and then because they match, you can you can rely on the authentication happening on some, some other website to identify yourself as a domain name. So that's great um, for identifying people, but it doesn't help when we're talking about um, wanting to actually post to your site, because you need a way to get a token to post to your site. That's beyond just identifying you. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, is somebody taking notes? Is that okay? Yeah, I just, or, just is the Etherpad already going? Great. Um, did you use the link from the schedule? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so yeah, so Realme Auth is, is just about identifying people. Um, the uh, sort of missing piece in Realme Auth is if you don't have one of those accounts, uh, or if the, the, the it requires two people to be involved in, in this process. So me, as a, someone with a website, I have to have an account at a silo that supports authentication. So I have a bunch of these down here. Um, not everybody actually wants a Twitter account or a GitHub account, etc. Um, and then it also, support, it also requires that the site you're logging into has registered an API key at one of the silos that also intersects with your map. So if I only have a Twitter account and I'm logging into someone who's implemented Realme Auth who only has GitHub API keys, there's no way to log in. So we're missing that. So Realme Auth is great because it lets you quickly bootstrap on, especially when there's really only a handful of common OAuth providers that people actually care about and most people don't mind having a Twitter account or already have one. Um, it's great for that, but it's missing the piece of if you don't have any of these in common, then you actually can't log in. There's nothing there that tells you to do. So distributed in the auth uh, helps with that case as well, because it allows you to use your own site to log in as an OAuth provider. So um, let's talk about the, jump into the, the protocol. Um, as an outline. So there's there are two different aspects. Anytime you're talking about signing in, there's authorization and authentication. Authentication is also known as identification. You want to know who the person is and know that they are logging in. Authorization is when you're talking about, I'm going to let this app do something to my account. And um, they have different security requirements, so it's often useful to talk about them separately. Um, let's talk about just the simple case of logging in. Um, so this is, I need to log into the wiki, and uh, or any, any site, just I just want to log in as Um and I don't want to use 
Realm EOF. So as someone who's writing this software, um, in, this, in our example, the wiki, I don't want to have to write the Realm EOF logic into the wiki source code. So instead, let's walk through what it looks like for using IndieAuth itself to, to log the person in. Um, so essentially, uh, I have I, so I have AaronParky.com. I'm going to set it up as an OAuth provider. Um, what I do in that case is I create a link uh, called rel equals authorization endpoint. I put that in my on my homepage, and that is how an app will find out where to send me to log me in. So this is the sort of distributed aspect of it. This basically says, let the user choose what their authorization endpoint is. Authorization endpoint being the screen that says this app is trying to sign you in, authenticate somehow, click the yes button, et cetera. Um, now in my case, it's actually a page on AaronParky.com. And that means I'm hosting my own authorization endpoint. Um, you can do that, and you don't have to do that. You can use any authorization endpoint that supports the protocol. One of the authorization endpoints that supports the protocol is indieauth.com. And this is where I wish it wasn't called indieauth.com. And I'm planning on renaming it. I just haven't settled on it. Settled on a name yet. Um, this is kind of analogous to how OpenID had OpenID providers, and you could sign up for one such as myopenid.com, you would sign up there, make an account, probably with a password at their site, and then you copy the tag onto your homepage, and then people would be, the app would send you to myopenid.com to do the, the dance. So this is pretty much analogous to that. Um, so when you're writing, so when someone's writing software like the wiki that wants to identify the user, the first step is you, you make a form that says, type in your website address. So Let's see, I think I'm not logged into this yet. Um, oh yeah, this is a great example. This one doesn't, this one's just signing in. So here's an app. It's not important what this does right now. Uh, there's a login button. So type your web address in. Okay. And click login. What, what's happening now is Telegraph will find my web page find the link tag with Rogs authorization endpoint and send my browser to that page. Cool. So as far as Telegraph is, is concerned, it's lost track of where I am. It doesn't know who I am yet. It doesn't know whether it's actually me, et cetera. Um, I happen to be logged into my website already, so I don't see a password prompt. Um, I, my password's too long, so I'm not gonna log out. Um, but yeah, so I'm already logged in, so it already knows who I am, my website does. If I hit approve, what'll happen is my website will generate a temporary authorization code and then redirect me back to Telegraph. So if you look at this URL, um, there's a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, this piece, redirect URI, is important. This is what's going to happen is after I click approve, my website will send this browser back to this URL. Um, so I'll do that. And unfortunately, it's, it happened too fast. You didn't see it. But what happened is it sends it back to that redirect URL with a code on, in the query string. That code is a temporary authorization code. And Telegraph then says, OK, and now I have a code. I think I know who this is, or at least who this person at this browser is pretending to be. Let me verify it's actually them. It then asks the authorization endpoint, hey, does this code, uh, this is separate server to server, does this code actually, is it valid? Is it, and, and who does it belong to? And that code only lasts for like 30 seconds. Um, so, and then my endpoint says, it's AaronParecki.com. Uh, this was just generated, so it's still valid. And that's the, then I'm signed in. Um, so nowhere in this process was any third party involved. 
and you, you didn't see Twitter, you didn't see in the auth.com. That's because I have my own authorization endpoint. Um, now, if I go to, if I try to sign in as adactio.com, I guess I've got an authorization endpoint. I may have written a fallback into, into indieauth.com. Let's find out. What have I got in there? You do. I've said indieauth can be the authorization. You, ha you have said indieauth.com is, author is the authorization endpoint. You actually have two in here. So um, and I think Telegraph is probably just picking the first. Yeah. Um, so in this case, Telegraph says, all right, I'm going to send the user to indieauth.com. Now, indieauth.com, there's no logging into it. There's no remember me every time you have to prove yourself. Uh, but that's just how indieauth.com works. Like, it could have a remember me checkbox. It could do any number of things. Um, indieauth.com has no passwords. The only way to prove that you are somebody to indieauth.com is to do one of these things. But this is not part of the indieauth protocol. This is just how indieauth.com happens to be authenticating the user. Which is actually a Realme off, Realme off protocol. Um, and this is why I said I wish I hadn't called this indieauth.com. Um, but the important, the important part here is that uh, Jeremy says, let indieauth.com handle my authorization. I, on my site, it's my site's going to handle authorization. Anybody can build their own. You can build a service that does things in a certain way as long as you are speaking this protocol. Um, so yeah, the protocol is essentially OAuth2 where all the identifiers for everything is a URL. That's a very indie web friendly version of OAuth2 basically. Um, if you're familiar with OAuth2, you'll recognize all the same parameters like redirect URL, client ID, authorization code, and all that. And if you're not, you're not familiar with OAuth2, don't worry about it because just read the guides and it'll walk you through it. Um, so, any, any questions so far? Does that make sense? So your slash auth page, if you're not logged in, does that become a login? It becomes a login form. Um, let me, actually I'll do an incognito window. Yeah. Continue signing in to, right. to this app. Then we just do that, and then you're back to where you were. Yeah. And I, I made this button say sign in and approve because as soon as I do this, it redirects me immediately to Telegraph. There's no separate, I'm not like reprompted or something. I just wanted to skip a, a step. And if you don't type in the right password, you can't log in as me. Um, and this uses a password, but I could have done any sort of authentication mechanism here. It doesn't have to be a password. It's entirely up to me. I could have done a browser certificate. I could do a hardware key, um, whatever. I could use Twitter. Um, as far as the, as far as Telegraph, the app is concerned, all it, care, all it knows is that it redirected me to slash auth with a bunch of junk that I added to the URL, and then it's going to get back a code that I can verify. What's behind this in terms of technology? Um, kind of what language database and stuff? Uh, in in my case, it's PHP. Okay. It doesn't really matter. No, no, I, I know it, it, it was just specifically. Yeah. yeah, this is a PHP site, um, and yeah, pretty much written. Uh, it's it's in a framework, but this is not part built into the framework. So this is just simple simple um, code. Um, there's, yeah, so this, the, the, the way to build this URL, there's a couple, I'll go through the pieces in this URL. There's um, this me, which is the URL the user entered, and that's because if this site actually is, um, 
has more than one user on it, this tells the site who is expecting to log in so that it can optimize things that could either like um, check for the session active for that user, it could reject if it's for a different user. Like this happens on Twitter a lot. If you ever tried to log in, you click a Twitter button and then you're like logged into the app as some other account because you didn't realize you had logged into a different Twitter account before. Um, and then Twitter has a special parameter they added so that you can force the user to re-log in every time so that you don't accidentally skip it. Um, so this also solves that step. Um, there's the redirect UI, which is where my site will take the user back after logging in. Uh, the client ID identifies the application, and that's where this comes from. Um, I I'm just haven't got around to um, fleshing this out, but on indieauth.com, um, actually we probably saw that with, uh, with Jeremy's. So we end up on indieauth.com and, ah, I didn't do it for this one. Um, it'll actually show the icon and the app name, not just the URL. So that's what, that's because the client ID can, can say, uh, can also provide an H card with the application information. And that looks a little nicer than just, just showing the URL here. Um, there's client ID, there's a uh, state, which is, um, a string that the uh, application telegraph makes up. And it's meant for doing uh, CSRF attack prevention. Um, that way, because this URL is essentially, uh, without the state parameter, this URL is entirely, um, I can generate one for any application by the client ID. So if you use a state, then the client can check the state matches when it comes back. That way you can't like hijack and send people to these authorization URLs unless the, the application was actually expecting it. Um, but it doesn't have any meaning to the user logging in. It's just a client side thing. And then the response type ID, which is just saying we want to know who the user is, but we we're not trying to get authorization. Um, yeah, so. That those are the pieces involved in building that URL. So if you're building an app to sign someone in, you have all these parameters to go through, create this URL, send them there, you wait, and eventually you're gonna come back uh, to the application with a code. Uh, you first check to make sure the state matches what you expect. So you can like check in a session or however you're doing state verification. Check that that's something you expect. Check, uh, then you take the um, the, the me URL, the, user, the URL the user signing in will be in the query string as well. And you can then exchange, you can, you can verify the code there because uh, you know who it's from, who, who you're expecting it to be from. Um, and once you've verified the code, you, you're, you're signed in. Um, so that's basically this flow. These, these diagrams are useful, but they're always a little bit overwhelming to look at at first but it's not actually that bad. Um, yeah, click, click the login, fetch the home page, discover the auth endpoint, redirect the auth endpoint. Uh, the auth endpoint verifies the user, redirects back to the application, which then verifies the code of the auth endpoint, and then the user's login. So that was walking through that. Um, yeah, so that's that piece. Um, one question is there some um, um, some idea how to to name that auth endpoint in terms of the um, DNS name is there some convention or something I mean I, obviously I couldn't name it anything but um, I think here I see it's in the dot example dot org because I'm thinking about writing my own so the question is um, if I do it on my domain or on any domain would it be in the dot something dot com or um, there's no requirement for any, anything, it can be anything you want. Um, one advantage to having it be just your domain, like, like mine is just amparky.com slash auth, is that the cookies are already shared. So if I'm logged into my website, I'm already logged into this okay. authorization endpoint. 
and there's a separate cookie to, to get. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you point to the realme anyway, right? With the, not realme, with the authorization. You, you always link to the, the URL as with the relic authorization endpoint, so it really can be anything. Any URL. Mm -hmm. So um, to clarify the, the terminology um, again, so basically what uh, what you said, realme auth is just when you when you input, um, authenticate the user using third party, and then when so the uh, the indie auth flow. Um, so actually, indie auth is actually distributed indie auth, right? Because uh, um, yeah, it's just the, the confusion. Thing. Yeah. And that's and that's yeah. again that's my fault because the way that I started this was writing in the auth.com to abstract out the yeah. realm auth piece. I'm not sure if it is a fault because for newbies in the auth sounds really more familiar than realme auth or so yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Re realme auth is not the greatest name either, but yeah. uh, but it's I should have just I should have yeah, named this yeah it's more specific yeah. but I should have I should have named the service something that is neither of those. Mm -hmm. No, what I what I'm thinking is that um, so um, essentially just because Realme Auth again um, is uh, built on third party providers, so the, the best way is to say okay to u really use Indie Auth, you should um, say okay this is my authorization provider and that um, and now I think this goes goes already a bit into the uh, the onboarding um, uh, discussion maybe because right now. Um, like what, what we tell people to come to the and say, okay, just add Realme to your page and you have Indie Auth. Mm -hmm. So um, but that, that is not quite true because then on the other side, when, um, when we start to implement um, services like, like Telegraph or uh, the one, one I showed before, Cloud Objects, where I want to have Indie Auth login, um, I didn't want to implement the Realme Auth part my, myself and I also didn't want to have the uh, fixed third party dependency. So, um, so I said, okay, we need this authorization endpoint. So, um, what would be? Uh, I'm thinking whether um, it should be good, uh, like best practice to say, okay, if the user doesn't have authorization endpoint, to fall back, or is uh, any service that uses in your auth should tell you, okay, set your authorization endpoint. You can set it to just delegate to in your auth.com, but at least be aware that it's your decision that you mm -hmm. delegate there. It's not the um, the relying parties uh, or the uh, consumer's decision. Yeah, I I think that um, it's it's tricky because it's, it's this balance between you want to make it easy for people to set up, but you also want to make it uh, to have them be in control of things. Yeah. Um, so the, the the most important thing is that the identifiers for everybody is their domain name. So that's that's we have to we have to have that as the starting point. Yeah. How that's accomplished, there's two ways to do it, essentially. There's tell the user to uh, delegate to an authorization endpoint. Um, and the other, uh, the other way is link to one of these OAuth providers, common OAuth providers, and let the application do its best to match it up. And that's, at least that way, the application is still um, using the domain name as the identity and not the third party OAuth provider as the identity. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's, I think there's a, uh, it's, as, as a consumer or application, you're always gonna wanna have fallback because you don't want to, you wanna support a lot of people uh, and you don't wanna make it super hard. So trying to do that in a, useful ways is it's a bit of a trick but i think it, yeah finding look for their authorization endpoint and if there isn't one you can um look for the realm links and then how you actually authenticate the looks of realm if you don't want to write the code for each provider you can use a service like in .com to do it for you which brings me to the other piece of this puzzle, which is the other job that IndieAuth.com plays, um, which I want to split out as a differently named service to clarify this. And this is, you're building an application and you want to support Realme Auth, but you don't want to write 
you don't want to register for API keys at every service and you don't want to write all that for yeah. a lot of code to maintain it. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a service that handled that for you? Uh, and it turns out there is, it just happens to be called indieauth.com right now. Mm -hmm. But what that's actually doing is that's the application is, has this trust relationship within the auth of common in that case, and it's letting it handle all of the OAuth logins using its API keys. Um, and the user doesn't need to know that that is a separate service. It should actually not look like a separate service. It should look like part of the service you're logging into. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, yeah, that's the second role in the auth.com plays. And I need to split these things out so that they are called something different and look different because they are two completely different things because they are trusted by different people. You as a user, if you want to delegate your, delegate your domain to indieauth.com as an authorization endpoint, you can, and that's you trusting mm -hmm. indieauth.com. But as a developer, yeah. the other side of that is the developer can trust indieauth.com. Um, it's, it's confusing. I'm sorry. So one yeah, I think this is something that, that would have to be sorted out because it, it's really, really confusing, especially for uh, beginners to indie web. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe uh, just one more thing. Um, maybe just a um, question. Who, who of you has uh, like Realme on their website? Okay, and who has the authorization endpoint on their website? Yeah, we'll to in yeah, to in yeah. Yeah, I mean, and just any. If just you have the, the tag the on check it, is there. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, so my. So now, now, now the thing is like uh, I, I want um, to just review a question. So this means like more than half of the people right now would not be logged into my site because I'm. I'm so yeah. ah. so they just so yes. that's the thing. So my yeah. question is now: Should I tell you, okay, please add that, and then you can log, or should I do that that fallback? Mm. You should do the fallback. Okay. Yeah. If you want the users, I think you. Yeah. But the question is, could the fallback, it just in terms of UI, nudge people to realize there is room for improvement? Like you're you're getting the Realme auth options because yeah. we found something yeah. lacking on your site. Yeah. That yeah. would that will probably be your job, yeah. I suppose, in the in in the UI that gives the Realme auth fallback. It, that I don't know. Maybe there's like needs to be like a red entry in the seven green entries that says, I don't know, whatever domain I was supposed to look at slash auth. There's no authorization endpoint defined or something. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Just like yeah. yeah, and then it'll still giving people a path to 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 realize that there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad idea. Um. The so the thing I I. Guess, I think I'm still, I don't have an authorization endpoint specified because up until now I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. So it may actually be a bit of a skewed statistic yeah. there. Um, I, mean, I may have one by tomorrow evening, <laughs> who knows? Um, but my question is, you get your own login form in your own, your own auth provider asks for a username, but whatever username you enter, doesn't the system that has just sent me to the auth provider, just get back aaronparakey.com and uh, like, yes, that's him or her. Um, so actually, Is it more it, granular? It does let the response send back a different URL. So, so you could create virtual URLs for whatever users you have. Yeah. Grandma.aaronparakey.com so, or even that dot, or, Yes, or, right. Because yeah. that, that's the, I think that goes, that flows right into the next talk when I don't know, you may want to have your closed user mm -hmm. group on your website and you want grandma to be able to log in, but you don't want her to need to set up her own domain name mm -hmm. and everything, right? So that gets into permissions. Next, so you got identity. Well, yeah, so identity is, is one. Yeah, and I, um, basically this last step of verify the code, the response actually contains the fully resolved URL for whoever just logged in. And you could on the fly create URLs for you can other make it, yeah. users. And one of the reasons for that is um, if I type in just aaronparecki.com in the login box, the, the consuming site might auto auto complete that to HTTP. And it wouldn't match. With no slash at the end. Yeah, and it wouldn't match. And that, but my full, my full profile URL is HTTPS 
call slash slash aaronperky.com slash, right? So the response to verifying the code sends back that always. Even if I, even if the site started out with just aaronperky.com with no slash or HTTP or one of my, one of my like aaronpk.com that redirects to it, if I type that in, it'll still send back the full HTTPS aaronperky.com. Um, so in that sense, I, I'm kind of like mapping a bunch of URLs down to one, yeah. but it also is another way it. of, uh, you can type in just with known.com, log in with your known account, and it'll send back your full profile URL. Uh, which is still weird, say like talking of grandpa, right? But then grandpa is, um, is getting a login kind of dialogue and you're telling him to just enter I don't know, familyname.com because his son or even his grandson has created an OAuth, like kind of this, but it's kind of weird. Like he doesn't, he can't go and write his username. He first has and to you write. Could, a, you could. I mean, at but the, how would you know how to kind of resolve that? So if grandpa so goes not, to Telegraph. Not username, but, but uh, web address. So I could, I grandpa could type. Grandpa dot Aaron Parakey dot. Yes. And if I have a profile URL there that links to the authorization endpoint, that works fine. Okay. So like, I could actually set this up to link to the authorization endpoint at aaronparecki.com, type this in, and then I would end up being logged in as aaronparecki.com to telegraph. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that you, well, that's something that you could strip away if you had your own login dialog. Say you wanted to log in on your own site using your own auth provider still, so still just to keep the whole infrastructure, you could actually just write Aaron. Because you could infer Well yeah, I mean the uh, right, you could just have a default that goes to Aaronpk.com slash Aaron. I don't really need an email address field here, for example. Because there's only one user on this site. Yeah. All I really need is the password field. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the only thing that can actually work because this is one domain, so it can only be one user. Well, um, no. So in my case, it is one domain for one user. But if if my site was Parecki dot com, uh, and my or my family name is Parecki dot com, if my website was Aaron Parecki dot com slash Aaron, now Parecki dot com has multiple users. And right. is that competi uh, compatible with uh, with all the other um, indie web things? Um, mostly, I think some some consumers were uh, assuming that a domain name uh, would would use just the U the domain part of the URL. But I think everybody's updated since then. That was many years ago. Okay. Basically, a, a profile URL, a profile URL doesn't matter how many hosts or path components there are in it. That might have been what was getting in the way a few years ago and I wanted to do it for Hubtuff. But that could be. That your profile URL yeah. was you know, hubtuff.com slash username. Yeah. But now, yeah, it's yeah. One, one domain but with plenty of users. Yeah. So, I do want to talk about the whole permissions and authorization aspect of this. But I don't want to completely so just in terms of why I would want to potentially have independent uh, authorization. So I was saying, I've got my CMS which does login and then it also does posting interface and all this stuff. And I could, if I wanted, um, stop using my, post, my own posting interface and entirely use other people's because I've got a microphone in front. Right. But the way I authenticate with that, with those other services, like, um, well, for example, is with indieauth.com, which is Realmia. So I'm currently relying on Twitter or GitHub or some other provider of OAuth. If I just wanted to not get locked in to any kind of third party, it would be nice to have the option of my own. So the login part of my own CMS. Uh, to turn that into a standalone. Well, there are two other options in any of um, which do not rely on external services. One is mail or, yeah, of course, and the other one I liked is GPG or, yeah, because you just sign a message with your browser, 
and you can decide how do you implement GPG in your browser. Do you have to um, put in an extra password so that it is um, signing the message, or don't you? Depends how do, how do you use the machine here, and um, then you are also not not um, you don't have to rely on other services. And I also have a um, proposal, a small proposal for mail or so that you can. Um, can put your mail address encrypted on your website, then it is safe against um, spamming because otherwise anybody could spam you from india.com by just sending sending a ping with your mail address who wants to log in and you get mail every time. And then you could um, um, and, um, put it in a JSON web talk or something. We can talk about it, what's the best. and. Um, um, you can log, uh, log in via mail, which, which has a benefit for me that if my one domain with, with the authorization endpoint is down, I have, I don't know, three or four mail addresses I could use, um, and one server will be fine. And then I don't have to rely on external services. Mm -hmm. It's just a third option then, maybe. Yeah, so the uh, this is a list of ones on my site, which there's, you know, there's Twitter and GitHub, but there's also yeah. email and GPG, which some people support only those two and they don't have Twitter and GitHub listed. Uh, but this is a feature of IndieAuth.com's implementation of authenticating people. And the thing he's talking about was, like, right now, any, anybody can go to IndieAuth.com, type in my domain name, and they'll see this list, which has my email address in it. Also, my email address is on my homepage in plain text. I can send you uh, yeah, and a yeah, so email. anybody can go here and click this and it'll send me an email. And that's probably not ideal. Um, any of the other ones that you click, I no harm, that no harm. To, uh, but you know, people are making attempts to get into an account and this the forgotten your password. Yeah, stuff, yeah, it's awesome. like that. It's it's yeah. but yeah. in this case, the visibility that you in this case, I'm yeah, advertising yeah. my email address, right? Yeah. So it's it's this is a little bit worse. Um, what's it, what he's talking about was having a button that's um, send me an email, but when you click it, it makes you type in a password that decrypts the email address on the homepage. Uh, IndieAuth.com needs to be able to decrypt it, so you give it the password, it decrypts it, and then it sends it. But that way, anybody coming along can't just submit yeah. this button. Um, so yeah, it's, that's a nice optimization. And it's something that um, any of the, uh, any of these endpoints could implement that. Um, there's other signature methods you can use too, like SSH key. It could do that. Um, but, but, do, do, so, but the way it describes my server, <coughs> I currently got my, I got my login and my posting interface. I could easily not use my posting. Like mo because I have MicroCloud, I could just use other people's posting interface or my own posting interface. Mm -hmm. I have one post but, but login but right you, now. It would, it would make sense for me to have an independent... How do you log into your site right now? Just use a password. You have a password, okay. Yeah. So the, the, sh the path for that is basically you implement a page like aaronfranklin.com slash auth, which recognizes these parameters and it has your password field. Yeah. And then um, it generates the, the authorization code. Um, and then you, then you would basically, you would set your authorization endpoint to that URL. And then anytime you're logging into these things that recognize the authorization endpoint, you would never see a Twitter prompt. Okay, so I, password, and I, so I generate a token of some kind that's, I store somewhere briefly. And so... Yeah, so that is um, the, so this, this piece, oh, that's not, that's not work. yeah, there's an SSL error connecting to that. Uh, so these pieces of the URL, your your website, you need you need a page on your site that recognizes these parameters. Uh, there's a couple of things to validate to make sure that redirect URI is a URL. Make sure that there's a state parameter, et cetera, et cetera, do some validation, um, and then you have the password prompt. And it, so it's the same URL in your case, um, 
from where I would go to log in and where I go to authenticate a token. Uh, uh, no, my login form is different, but if I'm not logged in, this has a login form on it. Yeah, this is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, but you basically need a page that, if you're not logged in, will let you log in. I mean, you can also don't have to implement the this version of it. Like, you can always have a password prompt. You don't need to have. You don't need to recognize that you're already logged in. You, like, oh. it could just always prompt you for your password, right? Right. Um, and then an optimization is to be like, oh, you're already logged in, so I'm just going to put a button here instead. But it's an optimization. It's not okay. required. Yeah. So from here, I create a token, I send it. So back. this this will be a form yeah. that submits to a page. That page is going to get basically you need to pass all these parameters in again to that form. So, uh, get or post here. Is that a this is a get because so uh, so that, that's a link there. Or approve. It's not a. Uh, not this a, is actually a post. That's a post. That's yeah. A, yeah that's a, that's a, okay. Um, so send back the. And yeah, so you'll you'll get a you'll basically make a form that a, does a post request to your site that includes the password. You'll check the password, and then if that passes, um, make a token. Make a token. Store it somewhere. Yeah. Make sure it expires in like thirty to sixty seconds. Um, and then take the redirect URL and build this URL, which is uh, that redirect URL, add code equals blah, the generated thing, and then add the state, whatever they sent. Uh, so whatever they pass in the state, just append that. Send it back. Okay. Uh, and then that's it. That's all, that's all that endpoint does. Uh, oh, that's, that's the, first, the first half of that. Then it needs to be able to verify the codes. So the telegraph will then send the code back to you from its server and say, hey, is this code valid? And then check it against the token. Check it against however you store tokens, uh, and then reply with adapter.com. Okay. I just want to mention there are some um, external services um, which we could use, but which are not used yet. And this includes a complete stack exchange network which has the uh, Realme links in the profiles. I've implemented it. You know, st um, Stack Exchange yeah, has a... Uh, overflow, Stack Overflow. I guess they do have an OAuth API. And so on, and yeah. and yeah. Another one is Instagram, but... Um, um, you have to get an API key though, but you can't, and you can't do that unless you get approved now. Yeah, I, I, got, uh, I got it approved, but um, um, it was very strange because, um, well, they took... Um, uh, um, well, but it's not the, the, um, the um, there's another problem because many things go through the React parser. This is, um, there's a funny picture, um, Jeremy stands in front of Flickr.com, having JavaScript disabled and seeing a complete white page. Oh, yes, and, and, and uh, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, but um, usually when you use such pages for, for indie auth, you could um, send them to the React parser, which I'm doing on the server, and um, then you get the page. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's not nice, but uh, and it's not it uh, how the web was supposed to work, but yeah. um, you could do it. I, I just want to mention it. And um, well, another thing, if we already have a state part, this, uh, this state thing um, to prevent uh, man in the middle attacks or CSRF attacks, um, we could do it like um, you have just the button um, log in with in the out without entering your address first. Then you are, um, um, but the um, but then you must um, have the state parameter. So the the person who has um, the button must send the state parameter and the redirect URI to indiauth.com, for example. And then you could enter your domain on indieauth.com, um, which has the um, advantage that, um, for example, autofill will be reliant because it's also on indieauth.com and you press one but letter. But that doesn't actually solve anything because now the application is hard coded in the auth.com. Uh, right now, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that doesn't actually solve any of the, that doesn't solve the underlying problem. Um, the, but, what so I meant is that you don't have to enter your address um, in at thousands of different um, domains, but just at indieauth.com because 
Um, but indiegelf.com is a temporary thing. It's not a long-term solution. Yeah, okay. So it's, like, ideally, it shouldn't have to exist because all the sites are doing, are supporting the protocol. Because it support is centralized and not decentralized. So yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not centralized, it's just, it's... It's, it, it's one implementation and there need to be a bunch of implementations. Yeah. Uh, and, like, Telegraph doesn't need indieauth.com. Telegraph will only use indieauth.com if you tell it to. Yeah, yeah. It's but, the same with which the means same that, now, yeah. the, that Telegraph, uh, it has to have that URL field, because it doesn't have anywhere to send you to until you enter your, your URL. And if you, if Telegraph were to hard code in neoth.com, then sure, it might yeah. save some people yeah, some yeah. typing, yeah. but there should be a lot more of these services than just in Yeah. So it doesn't, it shouldn't, it doesn't actually, well, it's in the long run, problem. it won't actually save it's, any time. Um, maybe solves the problem for totally newbies, because then they click the button and in neoth.com would have the advantage to teach them, you know? Yeah. Um, but so what I've done with um, along the lines of teaching, what I've done with Quill is it will um, it prompts you for your domain name, and if you type whatever you type in there, it will tell you exactly what you need to do to get to the next step. Yeah. So if you don't have an authorization endpoint tag on your site, you'll see a message saying, "Hey, you should add this authorization endpoint tag." If you go to Braille me links, it'll say. If, yeah, yeah um, I think this one might. So let's see. This no, you have you have full micro back that up. Example.com. Example.com will Yeah. So we have three errors. Couldn't find your authorization endpoint. You need to set your authorization endpoint. Copy this. If you do that, it turns green. And then you get to the next step, which is now you need a token endpoint. Now you need a micro endpoint. Uh, and then this has the advantage of, um, like, you can actually just copy and paste this because indieauth.com is a full implementation of it. You can also copy and paste, um, oh, no, I didn't include it in this one. Uh, I have a token endpoint that you can also use without implementing Oh, just choose that one? Mm -hmm. What's that? It's tokens.indieauth.com. Okay. Um, What's the domain, this one? This is own your gram. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but then, obviously, there is no copy and paste for a micro event point because you need to build that yourself because yeah. it's going to your site. Um, but I think this is a pretty good, um, pretty good, like, let's help you set this up. Let's tell you that you can just use this one or you can build your own. Um, but most people don't want to, want to start by building that. Most people want to start by building the micro event point. That's the thing they actually care about. That's the thing on your site that does the stuff. Um, later, you can go build an authorization endpoint, like Jeremy is talking about. Actually, just this is a complete tangent. I'm curious. People putting rel links in head versus people using actual HTTP headers. Mm. Show of hands, like anybody using headers? I think I have mine in headers. You do? Yeah. Okay. Everybody else is HTML. Yeah. Ah, so, okay. Just wondering, maybe I, I should just use headers. I don't know. Is there a pros cons? Um. For this application, I, normally the one of the pros of HTTP headers is that it works for any content type. So mm -hmm. if the URL that you're serving is not HTML, then putting links inside that can be a challenge. XML kind of has XML has rels. You can do rels in XML. JSON doesn't really have that concept of links, right? Uh, but for we're talking about we're talking about people's home pages, which are pretty much always going to be HTML. Yeah. Um, the uh, one of the other advantages of, of the HTTP headers is that you can set it in the web server config. Yeah. Um, so that will it'll like it'll be served on every page if you want. It'll be served whether you change your backend to some other CMS later. You can keep all the headers coming out the same because they weren't generated by the CMS. Um, but those are like, I don't know, 
fringe benefits yeah. at best. Yeah, I'm still using tangent. I'm just curious. Um, what about um, redirects? Actually, um, would would it work to have the header? But um, so, for example, I'm. Um, I'm providing an endpoint that I actually want to for the content to redirect to something else, but um, um, to have the um, maybe that's totally stupid. I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure, but to have it in the um, header because I'm not actually delivering any uh, body. So yeah. I, I have a redirect. It's AaronPK.com. There's no HTML there, um, but it sends back a redirect to AaronPK.com. Um, but because I redirect the HTML, I, I, I redirect to the HTML page, I don't consider AaronPK.com to be its own identity. Mm -hmm. So I don't want it to serve authorization endpoint headers. Because okay. if I did, it would look like its own identity. Right. And would it work? It would work, yeah. If I send it in the header um, there, okay. Yeah. Because basically, um, like Telegraph would stop at the header and it would say, it wouldn't follow the redirect, it would just stop there it's and be exactly. like, I found an authorization endpoint. Right. Okay. Which, Maybe you want to do that, but I, I don't know. I can't think of a situation in which that is. Um, I'm thinking of a situation where I would have a domain like um, um, Oliver, which is my first name, dot goodpal, my second name, dot de, um, but the actual content um, should be at goodpal dot de slash Oliver. Then I could just because that was my earlier question. Um, if it's only it, if it would only be the domain part of um, that um, provides identity, then I would have to have subdomains for mm -hmm. different users. But maybe I wanted the content to be under the main content. Then I would do a three or something to to the content part. But I could still use the um, the, the subdomain as a um, as the identity. That's what I was looking into for the half type of thing a few years ago. Because I was, might have to do something like that. But now it sounds like. We're not fully Yeah, fully URLs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I wanted to mention this. This page on the wiki authorization endpoint. This is what you would read as a guide to how to do this. To what to do. Yeah. Uh, here is um, so you've already done this part. Uh, this is where you start following. Uh, this is that request I described, and it breaks down the parameters explains what they are. Um, verifying the users, so present something like this to, to you, showing the client ID and make sure that the user logs in. And then here's the redirect you build. So you send these three parameters. And then this is the auth code verification step. You're going to get a post request to that same URL, and it's going to contain the code it's going to contain the same client uh, client ID and redirect URI. Um, so you look up the code, make sure that it matches the redirect URI and client ID, and then reply back with uh, the URL. Um, yeah, that's. So this is also the other problem with with any auth is that I don't have this written up as a spec anywhere. It's written up like this, where it's a bunch of how to guides for every part of the service, which is really useful, but it, there is no single document explaining the protocol. And um, one more thing that um, um, I've, I was wondering, there's authorization endpoint, there's also token endpoint. Yeah. Um, that is made for historical reasons. So um, essentially, um, I redirect the user to the authorization endpoint, and if I, uh, then I get the code back. If I just want the, um, to confirm the identity, I send that code to the authorization endpoint. But if I want a token from the yeah, I have to send you the token endpoint instead. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so I don't know if we have enough time, but the, uh, the other piece to this is authorization, which is logging into an app like Quill where it's going to post to your site. And that's where the, mic the token endpoint and micro endpoint comes in. And that's basically, um, I'm not just trying to identify the user, I actually am trying to get a token. and. Tokens are have different security requirements from these authorization codes that are mm -hmm. temporary, so it, it's useful to separate those out. Um, so yeah, you like with just signing in, you type your URL, it discovers the authorization endpoint, sends you there, but then the app, instead of just verifying the code, it actually does a token exchange where it sends a code, but the response is a, a full token. That gives your site 
more opportunities to double check that everything is legit mm -hmm. and issue a token that has a different lifetime and um, can actually create posts. Um, there, there's also a guide on how to build a token endpoint on the wiki, as you might expect. Um. Right, I'm just looking at my micro button. I don't remember doing any token endpoints. It's the indieauth.com token. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, so this 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 site you can use as a token endpoint. You don't even need to sign up. Everything is sort of self-contained. Um, and basically, if you just if you just add that, it'll start issuing tokens for you. Um, and it gives you a way to verify them. Um, but you can also build your own. And here's how to build your own. This walks through, like, here's the two requests. Here's the request you get for. <coughs> so maybe that would be a first step. I mean, if I'm going to go, you know, all of I actually don't think building a token endpoint is a useful first step. Okay. Because at the end result is nothing changes. Yes. Like, when, when, when you're done, you don't get any new functionality, and uh, nothing looks different. So it's an optimization. Yeah, it's an optimization. Like eventually, you definitely should because yeah. you don't want to, you don't really want to be going over the network for all this stuff. But um, a more useful first step is the authorization endpoint because you can then completely avoid hitting in the auth.com and using Twitter login. And you can use this token endpoint in the meantime to just write half as much code to do that. Yeah. Which is nice. So like step one I have a is micropub endpoint. Step one is micropub endpoint because you get a lot of functionality from Which that. Which you can use within the auth.com. Yeah. Inside now, I want now. So make your own authentication. Mm -hmm. Which you can do just using tokens. You can use this token endpoint. Yeah. And the uh, boss level is all right, I'm just going to run my own tokens and you've got complete independence. Yeah. yeah. So that would be the right order. I think that would be the right order. Mm -hmm. That gives you the most benefit for the yeah. least amount of work at every step. Yeah, you get tangible benefits, yeah. Okay. That sets, that sets a road map. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Oh, we should. Uh, we should break. Yeah. yeah. Um, if anybody has suggestions for new names for <laughs> the two roles in the auth.com plays, I'm open to suggestions. I have not found anything that's stuck yet, but I want a, a name for in the auth.com the service that you can you as a user can delegate your domain to to um, avoid building an authorization endpoint. Uh, and I also want a name for the service that as a developer. You don't want to bother writing all the OAuth code for all the providers, so you just want a service that wraps it all for you. So. They're currently both basically called IndieAuth. And they're both called IndieAuth.com right now, which is so. But they're to totally different things. Nice it's <laughs> not a disaster.